Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming here today. Welcome to Domestic Violence Services Prevention Department's weekly webinars. We have these webinars on Fridays. We use this time to talk a little bit about some prevention, some education, and talk a little bit about what DVS has to offer the community that surrounds it. Uh, my name is Chris McBride. I am the manager of this department, and I am incredibly pleased and incredibly excited to uh, be bringing you this webinar today and be introducing Olivia, our brand new prevention educator, who's going to talk a little bit about gaslighting. Now, before we get into the webinar itself, I do want to send out some reminders, some things that we talk about before every webinar, but are super important and I would like you to keep in mind. So this is a tough subject a lot of the times, especially when we're talking about methods of control like gaslighting. If this subject is a lot, it's okay to take a step back. It's okay to take a break. Um, you don't have to be fully engaged, but if you feel like being engaged, we do have a chat function at the bottom of this webinar and a Q&A function at the bottom of this webinar. So send us questions and let us know how we can help. At the end of this webinar, we'll also talk a little bit about the resources we have as an organization. If any of this information strikes true and you want somebody to talk to, we do have advocates who handle our support line at 425-252-2873. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So that support line is available to you should you need it. It's available to you should you need it in the middle of this webinar. Feel free to give them a call. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and toss this on over to Olivia. And she's going to uh, talk to us a little bit about gaslighting. All right. Thank you, Chris. Let me share my screen. I think you're still sharing sound. Oh, um, let me stop that then. Okay. So uh, great question. How long is this class? Usually it's about 45 minutes to an hour, depending on uh, depending on the situation. I'm not showing that I'm sharing right now, but oh, let me... it says you are, but I could. Hmm. Yeah, it still says. Okay. <laughs> Well, let me let me do something here real quick. Let me see. Maybe I will share whiteboard. I'll share it. And then I will stop share. There Maybe. we go. I think that's going to be good. Let me see. OK, can people see this? OK. I can see it. OK, <laughs> then I think we're good. All right, I will go ahead and take it away then. Thank you. All right, so thanks again, Chris. And again, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, as Chris said, my name is Olivia and I'm the newest member of the prevention education and outreach team here at Domestic Violence Services of Snohomish County. It's been so wonderful to be doing this work over the last couple of weeks and just to be learning so, so much. And I'm really excited to be doing my first webinar for all of you. So today I'm gonna to be talking about gaslighting. Some of you maybe have heard of gaslighting before. Maybe some of you have never heard of it. Either way, totally good, totally fine. I'll talk a little bit about what it is, why it happens, some effects, as well as some connections to broader DV work and the work that we do. So before I really jump in, I also do want to make sure that I credit a lot of my sources. So a lot of this presentation comes directly from the National Hotline on Domestic Violence. They have a really useful resource page on gaslighting itself, as well as lots of other things that you can check out as well. I also draw from the One Love Foundation, which has really, really great um, trainings and some resources on healthy relationships kind of in general. I also draw a lot from Lundy Bancroft's Why Does He Do That?, which is sort of, at least in our organization, um, some leading literature on these kinds of controlling and abusive behaviors. So again, as Chris said, this can be a lot, absolutely. So please take care of yourself and do what you need to do during. So without further ado, I will jump right in. So just kind of starting off with this very basic question, right? What is gaslighting? Again, maybe some of you are totally new to this. That's really awesome and thank you for being here. So gaslighting at its most basic is psychologically manipulating a person into questioning their own sanity. And then as we can see here down on the bottom right, it is 
a form of emotional abuse. And it causes the victim to question, again, not only their sanity, but also their judgments and their very feelings. So what this eventually turns into is really a weaponization of the victim's own mind against them. There's a lot of conditioning that goes on here by the abuser. By denying and twisting reality such that the victim second guesses everything that they think, believe, and feel to be true. So like domestic violence in general, gaslighting is really, really centrally about power and control. So something that really ends up happening here is that the victim's decreasing ability to trust their own perceptions as a result of this patterned and kind of relentless behavior actually leads to an increasing reliance on the abuser to define reality. So this ends up giving the abuser a lot of power as they are the one who is shaping that quote unquote reality in the first place. That control piece really comes in because this, this does make for a much, much harder situation to escape from once this cyclical kind of nature comes into effect. So here I have listed a couple of different gaslighting techniques, different manifestations, ways that it can come across. These are all also directly from the national hotline. They're not necessarily cut and dry, not necessarily exhaustive. Oftentimes gaslighting can look like multiple of these things. It can look like bits and pieces of some of them, maybe not others, but I do think it's a really useful starting place to look at some of these strategies someone might use if they're engaging in this behavior. So we'll start here with withholding. Withholding is essentially refusing to engage in conversation with another person. It's pretending not to understand them it's refusing to listen to them in order to not have to respond. So that's really important because this goes beyond just the basic disrespect of not listening to another person. But it's this very intentional form of not listening that really evades and avoids all responsibility and any kind of responsibility of taking responsibility for your own actions. So that's the difference between withholding and just blatant disrespect, which is also a really unhealthy behavior as well. Some examples of withholding might be the abuser saying something like, I don't want to hear this again. Completely shuts down the conversation from the get-go. Another example of withholding might be, you're just trying to confuse me. This puts everything back on the victim, right? Puts back on them that what they're saying makes no sense or somehow that they're not being clear. Next, we'll look at countering. Countering is defined as questioning the victim's memory of events even when they remember them perfectly accurately. So this might look as blatant as you're wrong, you never remember things correctly. It might also be a little bit more subtle, something like, are you sure about that? I don't know, your memory is not the greatest. Countering is really, really centrally about attacking the victim's memory and their confidence in their own memory. And of course, this is very different from a natural dialogue or disagreement where two people might have different memories of an event, different versions of it in their head. I don't remember it this way. Let's figure out why you do. Let's talk about it. Countering is a very intentional and insidious way to deny someone their reality. Next, we'll look at blocking and diverting. So blocking and diverting involves a couple of different things. It involves changing the subject of the conversation and or questioning the victim's thoughts. So we saw how countering was really centrally about memory here we're looking at the victim's thoughts. So something that often will happen here is that the abuser will change the focus of the discussion. They'll change the focus from the original conflict or the original issue to the victim's credibility itself. So what this might look like is saying something like, this sounds like another crazy idea you got from such and such, or simply you're imagining things. Notice how all of a sudden we're not talking about the original conflict anymore. We're talking about how credible is this idea anyway? Where'd you get this idea? Where'd you come up with this? And all of the original conflict, all the stuff the victim maybe wanted to bring up slips through the cracks. Trivializing. Trivializing is making the victim's needs and feelings seem unimportant. So we talked about memory, we talked about thoughts, we're talking about these needs and feelings and trivializing is a very distinct action to actually make these things seem small, seem unimportant, seem insignificant and minimal. So this may include accusations of the victim being too sensitive 
or overreacting. An example of a trivializing statement might be, really, you're gonna get mad about that? Or simply, you're too sensitive. Or it's not that big of a deal, just get over it. All of these statements have a very, very minimizing effect. And they also tend to assert the abuser's opinion as the ultimate truth. Everything runs on their timeline, on their scale of how important things should or should not be. And this imposes this all onto the victim. Next, we'll look at forgetting and denial. So forgetting and denial, as I said, a lot of these can kind of blend with one another. So I think of this as a sort of countering with a tactic of withholding. So forgetting denial really just involves pretending to have forgotten what actually occurred or denying things like promises or statements made to the victim at another point. An example of this might be, I don't know what you're talking about or you're just making stuff up. Again, this is very different from a healthy dialogue in which two people are saying, let's, let's get this straight, let's figure it out together. Finally, we have stereotyping. In stereotyping, the abuser actually may intentionally use stereotypes of the victim's gender, their race, their ethnicity, their sexuality, nationality, or age in order to manipulate them. So what this really involves super importantly is the abuser's keen knowledge of the way that stereotypes function in the world and in institutions. This not only relies on their own personal biases, which they may or may not have or may or may not show, but really this, again, this acute knowledge of the way that stereotypes exist in the world. So an example of this might be telling a woman that no one will believe her if she goes to seek help because they'll think she's crazy or irrational. You've all probably heard that stereotype before. Telling a child, you're too young, you don't know what you're talking about, no one will believe you. Telling an immigrant, you don't know how it works here. So this comes up in an article from the American Sociological Review by Paige Sweet called The Sociology of Gaslighting. In this, Sweet makes an argument for this other sort of lens with which to view this phenomenon. I think we tend to think of gaslighting as a very interpersonal, almost intimate kind of dynamic and phenomenon, which is very true and very valid because it does take place in these relationships. However, she really importantly argues for this other lens that again, takes into account the way that the world works unfairly, advantageously to, other, to some and not others, and makes the argument that abusers do rely on these well-founded stereotypes, held not only by themselves, but by others so that they can continue their abuse. So history of the term. Some of you might be wondering why gaslighting, right? What does this have to do with a lamp? We'll get into all of that. So the term gaslighting actually originated from a British play from around 1938 that was later turned into a novel and I believe even a film. The play was by Patrick Hamilton and it was called Gaslight. Now in this play, there was an abusive husband who tries to convince his wife and everyone around them really that she is insane. And the way that he does this is by manipulating small aspects of her physical environment. And then of course, denying that any change is occurring much less that he is behind it. One of these manipulations included dimming gas lights in their home. So physically changing the lighting. And then, you know, what, what do you mean? It looks the same to me. You must be going crazy. Now, of course, the term in the way that we use it today and in this work, the psychological term, the term for abuse, doesn't have to necessarily do with the physical environment, although it could, especially if there's isolation taking place as well. But really what's important is that these central components of subtle manipulation and claims of insanity are still there. And that's where this got its name. So the next kind of question that we'll examine together is why does gaslighting happen? So gaslighting can happen to anyone. It is most common in intimate relationships or friendships with a power imbalance. So again, we're back here to power and control. Gaslighting occurs because someone wants to gain control over someone else. I'll say that again. Gaslighting occurs because someone wants to gain control over someone else. The abusive person may feel that they are entitled to control other people or that their feelings or opinions matter the most. Now, these may not be things that the abuser would say out loud or even know about themselves, but we know that attitudes 
worldviews, values, all drive behavior, and these can be very, very deeply entrenched. Now, in some cases, the abuser can have conditions such as narcissistic personality disorder, long-term symptoms of which include a constant need for admiration or attention, a belief that they are better than everyone else, and a lack of empathy. These are very real conditions with very real impacts. However, it's also important to note that disorders like NPD and others are not at all required for someone to engage in gaslighting or to be abusive in general. Unfortunately, many people who engage in these types of behaviors, you know, would have tests that would come back quote unquote normal or would otherwise seem supposedly normal. This is a learned behavior. So we'll look now at some of the effects of gaslighting, why this is so important and the very real impacts it can have on people to whom it's happening. So gaslighting generally happens very gradually in a relationship. It's also important to note that it may seem harmless at first. These little individual instances might not seem like a very big deal, but it's when these patterns continue, when they accumulate, when they compound, that they can cause the victim to feel a variety of very, very real and taxing effects. Confusion, anxiety, isolation, depression. This confusion comes from always second guessing yourself, never really knowing what's real or what's an overreaction. And it's also important to differentiate a momentary blip of confusion where you can resolve it with conflict resolution or a conversation or what have you from this constant state of confusion that is really very, very draining. That anxiety, again, comes from when you never really know what's real, what's happening currently, what's going to happen, especially that can be a very frightening feeling as well. That isolation, especially if the abuser is isolating the victim physically, this can absolutely exacerbate this. But even without that factor, you feel like you're the only crazy one. You feel like you're overreacting and you're doing it alone. That is a very frightening and very, very real feeling. Depression is also a factor. All of these things compounding can be very heavy and a lot to carry. That loss of sense of reality can also come in, the victim losing all sense of what's actually happening. And then again, they start potentially relying on the abusive partner more and more to define this so-called reality, which again, makes for a very, very difficult situation to escape from. So the next couple of slides will be talking about combating gaslighting. And this slide in particular is gonna be about knowing the signs. We are preventionists here, so I believe that knowing the signs of gaslighting is one of the most important ways to combat it before it even potentially begins to happen. So these are also directly from the national hotline. We'll go through each of them a bit and talk about how they relate to the context of this conversation we've been having thus far. So I'll start with this top one here. You constantly second guess yourself. We've talked about this a lot. This is a prime feature of gaslighting. You ask yourself, am I too sensitive? Multiple times a day, right? And we see a couple of things at play here. You're potentially have been told over and over again, you're too sensitive. Eventually you'll start to look in and you'll start to believe that. Even if you're not told directly, it's implied and it's implied all the time. And that's where that multiple times a day piece comes in, right? This is relentless. This isn't just an every now and then thought. You often feel confused and even crazy as we discussed. You're always apologizing to your partner. Now this comes from consistently taking blame, so to speak, for your own feelings, which are things you should never have to take blame for in the first place, especially when they've been weaponized against you very intentionally, when they've been distorted into crazy thoughts or crazy ideas by your partner. This will result in a lot of over-apologizing. You're right, I'm misremembering, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm overreacting. You can see how this starts to compound. You can't understand why with so many apparently good things in your life, you aren't happier. Again, gaslighting can happen to anyone. There's no specific kind of demographic or situation that would make someone susceptible. And because it is such a gradual an often subtle process, you might not understand why you're feeling confused, maybe anxious. Maybe you have everything else going for you, great. Maybe you have a great job, a roof over your head, friends, whatever it may be. You find, oh, excuse me. 
you frequently make excuses for your partner's behavior to friends and family. So this incorporates a couple of different things. A, this goes along with that internalization, again, of just putting down your own thoughts constantly, disregarding and minimizing your own feelings. But B, it also really serves as an attempt to control something. You're confused by your partner's actions potentially, and so maybe externalizing it with these excuses to other people, maybe that would help, right? And then the next sign here is you find yourself withholding information from friends and family so that you don't have to explain or make excuses. So that's sort of the next step here is that it's very, very tiring. It's exhausting to keep on doing that, especially to people that you love, people who love you, people who care about you, to continue to externalize these excuses and try to grasp for control like that. You know something is terribly wrong, but you can never quite express what it is, even to yourself. So this, again, could come from not quite being able to put a finger on what's going on, or even if you can put a finger on what's going on, it is really scary to admit that something like that could be happening. You start lying to avoid the put downs and reality twists. Again, this should go without saying that this emotional, verbal, psychological abuse is very, very hard to endure. So eventually you start lying to your partner potentially to avoid these interactions altogether. Yes, I remember it this way. No, that didn't hurt my feelings. We can see how this can become a pattern. You have trouble making simple decisions. So when you're conditioned into second guessing everything from your feelings to your very thoughts, all the way down to the beginnings of feelings, it becomes really, really hard when it's time to actually make a real world, real life decision to do that, even if it's just a simple one. You have the sense that you used to be a very different person, more confident perhaps, more fun loving, more relaxed. Again, this speaks to that gradual nature of gaslighting. You might look back one day and think, why, whoa, why am I feeling like this all of a sudden? Why am I acting like this? I don't seem like myself, whatever that may mean. This cognitive dissonance can be very, very off-putting. Nobody likes to feel like they're not acting like themselves or what they imagine or hope themselves to be. You feel hopeless and joyless, as we discussed. You feel as though you can't do anything right. Again, this is an effect of that conditioning. You can't think right, you can't even feel right. How can you be expected to act right, right? And finally, you wonder if you are a good enough partner. So ironically, you end up feeling remorse for the very feelings that your partner has weaponized against you. So this next slide goes over a couple of other ways to combat gaslighting that are perhaps less preventative and more applicable when you're more sure that it's actually happening, happening to you, happening to someone that you care about. So these are also from the hotline. I'll go over a bit about each of these three things. So we'll start with keeping proof. Keeping proof can look like several different things. It can look like keeping a secret diary or taking photos. Maybe you date your diary entries or maybe your camera roll app saves the time when your photo was taken. What this does is really just allows for fact checking later with timestamps. And this could be used in an interaction with your partner later with someone else, but it could also be used with yourself. Fact checking with yourself is super important when gaslighting is occurring because that's what that does. It splits your mind so that you can't quite fact check the way that you should be able to. Talking to a trusted family member, friend, or counselor if it's safe to do so is a really important way of keeping proof as well. Not only does it give outside perspective, perhaps validate some of these thoughts that you're having, but also just logistically, it makes it so that multiple people have the information that you have. Multiple people have heard your reality that you've experienced coming from your mouth. And that's a really important thing. Keeping proof can also look like making voice memos or taking voice recordings on your phone. This can happen immediately after an event. Maybe you're feeling off, something's not quite right. Make a voice memo in your own words. Quick recap of what just happened from your own perspective. And again, this can be useful for reference later, either technically with an interaction with someone else or just for yourself. Because your voice is power and knowledge is power. 
And gaslighting takes that away. Gaslighting weaponizes your own mind to target those things, to target your thoughts and feelings. So it's super important to reclaim that. Sending emails can be another way of keeping proof either to yourself or to a trusted third party if safe to do so. So proof is really important for a couple of reasons. It can be important for potential legal battles if that becomes relevant, but it can also be important regardless for protecting your own mental health, again, and for validating your concerns. It's also hugely important that proof stays, whatever type of proof it may be, stays safe and stays hidden. Safety planning. Safety planning can also look like a couple of different things. One of these is actually combating that isolation. Again, if it is safe to do so, speaking to someone, a family member, a friend, a counselor, it's really important. Planning for safe leaving of the relationship, if it comes to this, and especially safety after leaving the relationship are both hugely, hugely important for safety. Finally, self-care. Self-care really just involves taking care of yourself in the ways that bring you comfort. That's it. It doesn't have to connote anything in particular. It could be a spa day if you're into that. It could be a hike. It could be a nap with your cat. It could be a number of things, right? But what it's really about when you're ready for it to be about this is healing your mind. It's about taking time to process what happened to you. Gaslighting is a lot and it's a whole lot to carry. It's about working on not accepting responsibility for the abuser's behaviors, about knowing and relearning your own truth, about learning to trust your instincts again, because gaslighting wears this down, it conditions you. So have patience with yourself during this process, it's hugely important. Therapy can be a useful tool here for some individuals, potentially not others, everyone is different. So some connections to broader prevention work. I think it's really important to kind of draw these connections because of the work that we do as an organization and also just to zoom in and out from the specific phenomenon that I'm talking about today to just all this other stuff that all connects and is all really important. So a lot of this slide draws again from the One Love Foundation, just talking generally about healthy and unhealthy relationships. So as it turns out, Manipulation, isolation, guilting, and deflecting responsibility are all signs of an unhealthy relationship. And hopefully you can already start to make some guesses as to how these things relate to gaslighting. So in manipulation, one partner exerts control over the other's decisions, actions, and emotions. Again, you can hopefully see how relevant this is to the behaviors in gaslighting, particularly with regards to those decisions and emotions sides of things. In isolation, the abusive partner makes the victim choose between them and say their family or friends, even physically keeps them away from their family and friends. But perhaps most importantly to gaslighting, makes the victim question their own judgment around who they choose to spend time with, even potentially questioning judgment around who they have chosen to spend time with even before they met the abuser. This could be as blatant as saying something like, I don't want you spending time with so-and-so, but it could also look like, I don't know why you're friends with her, or I don't really trust them. You shouldn't trust them. What this does is it makes the victim look inward and say, wait, God, maybe they're right. Maybe I shouldn't be spending so much time with these people. Maybe my judgment's off. And it has a very, very isolating and frightening effect. In guilting, one partner makes the other feel responsible for their actions, or like it's the other's job to keep them happy. This really goes along with that over-apologizing aspect of gaslighting, and the general feelings of feeling crazy and overreactive and responsible, when really it's the abuser who's acting out. They are the ones demonstrating unhealthy mechanisms of control. Finally, deflecting responsibility, fairly self-explanatory, but that's defined as repeatedly making excuses for one's own unhealthy behavior. We see that a lot in gaslighting and even taking it to the next step of putting it back on the victim, putting all these, these excuses back on the victim. I didn't do that. It's in fact, it's your fault. You're overthinking it. So as important as I think it is to talk about unhealthy relationships and know these signs, I also think it's really important to look at healthy relationships, give us something to strive for, give us something against which to set gaslighting. So taking responsibility 
and healthy conflict are both signs of a healthy relationship. Conversely to deflecting responsibility, taking responsibility involves owning one's actions and words and avoiding placing blame. It's really about acknowledging, yes, this thing happened. Yes, I said this. Now how that's dealt with and how people feel about it can hopefully be resolved with healthy conflict. But this acknowledgement is hugely important because that is utterly denied in gaslighting. In healthy conflict, the partners will openly discuss issues and confront disagreement non-judgmentally. So hopefully you can see how totally opposite, opposite this is of gaslighting. In gaslighting issues are denied in the first place. And even when there is that conversation piece, it's absolutely full of judgment. No, you are too sensitive, you're overthinking this. And of course, based on falsehoods often. So there are a couple of other phenomena in the general discourse of abuse and these controlling behaviors that I think relate well to gaslighting. So we'll first look over here at Stockholm syndrome. It is really important to note that that is its own, Stockholm syndrome is its own occurrence. It's not at all a synonym for gaslighting, but they do share elements that I think are really important to bring into this conversation. So in when Stockholm syndrome occurs, the victim may actually emotionally bond with the abuser. They may begin to see things from the abuser's point of view even more than their own. And eventually they may begin to replace their own feelings with the ones that the abuser wants them to have. So hopefully we can see some consistencies here with gaslighting, that pattern of squashing your own feelings and eventually forgetting your own feelings, forgetting your reality. Next, we'll look at this phrase, because I love you. Now, this is a very interesting phrase, and it's not inherently a problematic one, but it's really important to parse out how this can become problematic when it becomes weaponized as a couple of different things. One of these things is a mechanism for control. The other is a way to deflect responsibility and also to justify continued unhealthy behavior. When this phrase becomes used in this way, then it really becomes one of the most central manifestations of gaslighting. I love you, so I'm gonna do this thing. And you must not love me if you're not doing this thing the way that I would want it done. I love you, so I'm gonna read your texts. I'm standing outside your house uninvited because I love you. You can see how this turns into a very slippery and toxic and even dangerous slope. Because that phrase, I love you is in there, it's a very, insidious tool for the abuser to manipulate the situation so that it suits them, while also, at least on the surface, saving face. I'm saying I love you, so how could it be wrong, right? So one of the final points I wanna talk about here with these kind of connections to broader work actually comes from Bancroft's literature on these types of behaviors. So it's really important to note that gaslighting behaviors like the abusive and controlling behaviors that he discusses more broadly is patterned, logical, and fixable. Now, like these words on the screen, actually, this is not always super easy to see. It doesn't always seem clear. But it's really important to note that in order to avoid facing the problem at hand, the abuser generally must convince everyone, including themselves, importantly, that their behavior makes no sense. They want people to be saying, wow, they're so out of control, so confusing, confounding, so unpredictable. They want their partner to try to figure them out as if searching for a missing puzzle piece, say. And what this does is it actually distracts from the fact that again, their behavior is patterned. Gaslighting follows a pattern. It is a continued, incessant, destructive pattern. Follows logic, a twisted logic, but logic nonetheless. I am entitled to control you. I'm capable of controlling you. My opinion, my values matter the most, right? And it is fixable, but the abuser doesn't want anyone to figure that out most generally. But this is evidenced by things we've talked about like countering or denial. These things that actually deep down rely on a knowledge that the very things they're denying did in fact occur. So to some extent, there can be some calculation at play here. 
This is also evidenced by things like stereotyping. Again, this knowledge of the way that the world works unfairly and a very distinct choice and willingness to weaponize that against another person. So an unfortunate reality that can arise from this is that sometimes therapy, the abuser going to therapy, can make the situation worse because the abuser can then actually begin to come up with new, almost creative ways to make their partner seem like the one who's crazy or responsible and continue this pattern. So I say that not to say that there's no hope and that it's unfixable, of course, but I say that to say that we can really see how far reaching and insidious this can be. And that is, I think, why it's so important to draw these connections from gaslighting to DV prevention in general, to zoom in on gaslighting, to understand how we can start and continue to disrupt these patterns. So here I have listed a couple of resources. These are alongside the ones that I mentioned throughout the presentation. Those ones are cited at the bottom of the slides, should you wanna go back and reference them at any time. But the resources I have listed here, I have DVS, that's us, so our hotline, which I believe Chris mentioned at the beginning, as well as our website, also the Washington State and National Hotlines for Domestic Violence, as well as their website. So with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you so much. Again, my name is Olivia. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out also if you think of one later. But Thank you so much. I hope to see you all in the future at other webinars, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Oh, great job, Olivia. I, uh, I wrote down all the spots that you messed up, so we'll cover that later. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, actually, right now, we've got a couple minutes. We've got about six minutes here on the 45-minute mark. Does anybody have any questions, anything they want to uh, kind of talk about, bring up. There was a comment uh, earlier, and Olivia, I don't know if you saw that. Yeah, I'm uh, looking at it right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was during the time when you were talking about the stereotyping, and I thought it brought up a really interesting point. So we got a comment, the panelists received the comment talking about how um, they can use the stereotype about themselves to discount somebody else's experience. I thought that was that was pretty present. Definitely, definitely. This is, um, I think that the conversation about stereotypes in controlling relationships is really fascinating. Um, partly because of the, the stuff that I talked about today, but also um, as Angela brings up, this can kind of be a double-edged sword um, in just thinking about stereotypes of A, sometimes what people, general public thinks abusers to be like. There's definitely stereotypes around that which is harmful in and of itself because there's no such thing as obviously a good stereotype, but also because that really does minimize the experiences of lots of other people who experience abuse at the hands of people who don't fit that stereotype. Um, and so that is a, that's a wonderful point. And also, um, yeah, there's conversations as well around um, intersectionality of racial oppression and gender-based oppression. Um, in which you know those conversations about stereotypes and discounting of the victim's points comes into play there as well. So there's lots of conversation to be had around that, but that's a great point. Uh, another another question that's come up um, is, I wonder what can be done for the victim to be able to trust again and not think everyone is trying to gaslight them. Hard to let go of. And before before you get into the answer there, um, I do want to point out. Usually, if we're talking about somebody who is on the other side of the relationship, who has um, exited the relationship that they were in, uh, we refer to them as survivors. So we might switch some of that language uh, at this point for that question. But yeah, when uh, a survivor what can a survivor do to learn to trust again? Yeah, definitely. That's a great question. Um, I think a lot of that is really about that self-care. Maybe self-care is not quite the right kind of term for that, but that aspect of it is super important. Just doing that reflection of relearning your own truth, getting back in touch with what really happened um, and relearning to trust your own instincts before you even start thinking about other people that are in your life, just thinking about yourself. Um, and I think that's a really important first step. But then, yeah, I mean, this is obviously not a 
quick fix at all. It's a very long process and it's very difficult. Um, so I think that's a really good question. And always, we're always looking for, for ways to kind of aid that process as well. So, yeah. yeah. And what I, what I can also say along those lines is um, A, counseling, checking to see, uh, check with your insurance provider, see if they have any counseling that, any counselors that have worked with DV survivors in the past, that can be a really valuable way. Also, I don't mean to be a plug for DVS, but we have support groups. We have multiple weekly support groups from individuals who are survivors of domestic violence relationships or who are currently in domestic violence relationships. So call that support line and we can hook you up with a support group as well, if that seems of interest. So those would be two methods that I'd identify pretty quickly. Um, as we're getting close closer to the end here, one thing that stood out, so everybody who's here right now, I luckily got a sneak peek at this, at this presentation uh, a couple days ago. So one thing I've been thinking about a lot recently is and you've met you mentioned Olivia how insidious this is and a it's a slow process a lot of the time um, to incorporate the gaslighting manipulation techniques but I've also been thinking a lot about how um, about how it preys on something that we all know is true and that's our inability to have perfect recall as a human being right? Like we know that the things in our past we see from our viewpoint and aren't necessarily the absolute truth. And so it's, I, I love the fact that you used insidious when talking about this. It's a slow creep, but it's like a creep on the very basis of who a survivor is. Um, and yeah, just thinking about how we're all vulnerable to that, that sort of manipulation of our background because we all understand we don't have perfect memory on absolutely everything we do. Our experience is our point of view, not the absolute truth. And so a lot of these techniques strike me as something that would be useful for everyone, not just survivors. Yeah, absolutely. I think we talked a bit about this recently as well, but I think that is a really, it's a really tough balance to strike because part of the whole thing that's wrong with gaslighting is that of course no one's opinion is the ultimate truth that's kind of the whole point but then you're also as a survivor or as someone who might have experienced this in the past trying to relearn your own truth and reclaiming the fact that your experience is real and it was true and so those two things are not mutually exclusive but they're also really hard to to balance with each other I think so that's absolutely really cool. and what's really useful in balancing those things is being in a healthy relationship with the people around you, whether it's family, friends, and knowing that you can trust them uh, in that particular way and they can trust you, which doesn't happen in gaslighting situations. Well, we hit 2.46, so we are gonna stop recording. Um, anyone who has any questions that they wanna do off recording, feel free to stick around. If you wanna hear uh, the mistakes that Olivia made and me list them out, that'll happen after recording. Otherwise, come back next week. Annie, uh, she's gonna be back. She's gonna talk about the power and control wheel. We've mentioned it a lot recently and I'm very excited to delve a little deeper into the power and control wheel. Uh, thank you so much, Olivia. Great job. Thank you everyone so much for being here. Again, show up next week. We're excited to see you.